Hi guys, I'm really excited to talk about this with you all. This has been a process that's been years in the making now. Um, I think we could start a little bit with hearing about how you first became connected since you are all from very different artistic fields. Uh, Troy and Ellis, you've done six previous works together. So what made this such a, a fruitful artistic um, collaboration between the two of you? Well, I think pretty early on, Ellis and I connected very closely, I would say, music and dance, and we were, I would say, somewhat artistically on the same page, and we had made one ballet together in 2015 called Invisible Divide that blended music, lyrics, and dancing together, and it connected in a very unexpected way. And in 2017, I spent a couple of months thinking about what do I want to do more than anything else right now at this moment? and. I settled on this idea of trying to tell a story through dance, but to try to tell a new story about people living today and experiencing things that we, I think as a country as a whole, are experiencing. And we went out for uh, sushi, as you reminded me, uh, a couple nights ago. And we just talked it through. And we knew very early on that we needed to find um, an excellent writer to collaborate with us on this. But it needs to be someone who works um, in scenario-driven work, who comes up with ideas that I think transcend reality to bring reality more close to us. And we reached out to Karen and she came on board and it's just been an incredible collaboration. And there's been many steps along the way, but we're just so excited to be here tonight and to have this world premiere in a few weeks. Karen, can you talk a little bit about um, whether you'd had any prior experience uh, working in theater or what this sort of invitation meant to you? Yeah, it was really exciting and it was a real surprise, you know. Um, it's just not every day that that uh, comes in your inbox. <laughs> um, and I was like, uh, you know, uh, a coward in high school, not a theater person. Uh, when I sing in my car, my kids are like, please stop. <laughs> so it's not, I wouldn't say it's my, you know, it was exciting to me for that too. And I had seen, you know, I watched some of the, their previous ballets and I was like, oh, this is truly um, a challenge and an exciting one to think what we can tell where dance is the language um, and, and where music is gonna be, you know, not just a soundtrack for the dance, but integral to the plot, integral to the world building. I think my favorite thing about fiction writing is building a world. And, and the greatest pleasure of these last few years truly has been um, seeing these other brilliant people come together to make a world. Um, and, and, and tell a story in, in a really, I think, very new kind of way. It's an old story in some senses. I think you guys will all recognize um, the emotional physics of it, the forces of work. You know, you have this siren song towards oblivion and this countervailing life wish, this earthly music pulling people back. But it's also, yeah, just a really new way to try to do things that fiction can't do. Um, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about those early brainstorming sessions. So you knew that you, the three of you get together, you want to collaborate, and you know it, you want it to be a narrative-driven dance, music, theater work, but um, where do you start from? Well, the, um, I remember very clearly, actually, uh, the first thing that Karen sent over, I mean, we, we had a couple meetings where we talked about ideas for uh, what kind of scenario would be, would be fruitful to you know, explore via this kind of hybrid model of dance and music that we were talking about. Um, and we settled on this idea of the siren myth, uh, but transposed to modern day Florida, and uh, which is in its own play, sort of way a very uncanny uh, space where these sublime natural beauty is often um, packaged uh, with a, a, a sort of a, a hokey kind of uh, uh, strange touristy energy sometimes. So we were talking about this scenario and then Karen said, let me just, you know, we're, we're gonna take a crack at this. And she sent over what she would call a hefty bag of leaves, but it was really like just these absolutely beautiful short stories imagining uh, these characters. And I remember reading it uh, in my inbox and just sitting there and being so excited uh, that this would be, you know, the seeds of this show, but that also I was like, okay, uh, you know, now it's uh, how do we find the skeleton to really create a libretto from this absolutely gorgeous prose? I'm curious to hear um, a little bit more from there then. Uh, how did we balance our individual um, artistic input? Uh, you know, did Karen have to write the whole libretto before Troy could make a step? Or Ellis, were you kind of making little musical compositions here and there? Like, how, how did we go back and forth before we ended up where we are now? Maybe Troy wants to take that. 
I think we really basically put one foot in, in front of the other this entire process. I think what became very clear um, from all of our Zooms and phone calls and emails is that this was turning into a pretty rare collaboration where all three of us felt very comfortable you know, going across to a different genre and a different form and giving feedback to one another about how we could you know, make this into something unique. We didn't have a roadmap for a type of work like this. And I remember you know, we had this scenario and there was this one really um, beautiful um, passage that you wrote out that actually became the lyrics to one of the um, songs in the first act of the show, The Vortical Song. And we built out this you know, early, I would say, like musical flavor, right? But through every step of the way, we were talking about choreographic logistics and singing logistics and what we thought was possible, what might not have been possible, and really um, built it. So it wasn't like she wrote us something and we, we took it away, like every day, every moment, we're all Yeah, you know, and, and I remember, so that was what I sort of assumed when I first got this email. I was like, oh yeah, I'll come up with, with sort of an idea and a world, and then they'll, they'll build it out. And I was like, and I was like, and Ellis, all you know, you'll write the lyrics, right? He was like, oh, I was kind of hoping we'd do that together. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it has been a joy, and it's really, I think that is really rare. It has certainly not been sort of um, that kind of order of operations where it's like the libretto and then the music and then the dance. We have imagined all of this from the ground up together, and it's a beautiful thing to sort of feel like we've held that vision together and made it. Um, and yeah, I do think that's pretty rare. Was that something that you had anticipated going in? Um, you know, I love, as I'm the rehearsal director for Troy, uh, getting to hear these little behind the scenes bits where Troy will be like, well, you know what, I'm gonna workshop this today because Ellis didn't love this step, uh, or I'll hear later down the line like, oh, I love this, I'll tell Troy, I love this lyric, and he'll be like, well, actually, that's, you know, maybe that's my input. You know, I, I, I tend to kind of box you guys in, but it really seems like um, you're, you are crossing those lines, and that seems unusual. So, Ellis, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I started working with Troy. Troy was my, my, first, uh, my first job out of college in 2012. Was, I got an email from Troy, you know, asking me to first music direct a piece for Ballet Collective, and then he commissioned a piece. And the thing I learned really quickly working with Troy was that he is um, really committed in a true truly sort of um, fundamental way to the idea of artistic collaboration. Um, and at first I was like, yeah, sure, okay, like, you know, we'll work with an artist and then I'll just write the music and then you'll choreograph it and that's kind of how it's gonna work because that had been my experience when I had done things previously and it, was, and it really was like, no, that is not what we're gonna do. We're gonna really be in the room together. We're going to um, try to transpose uh, the ideas from one medium across another medium and really think about that thoughtfully. Like, what does it mean to have a, a, a painter talk about the, um, you know, the uh, proportions of their work and then how does that affect the form of what I'm writing? And so that really primed me, certainly, at, for this collaboration, which has been um, absolutely like the most meaningful and deep artistic collaboration um, in, a, in a, you know, kind of true multidisciplinary thing. Uh, and so I think we, we were ready. I mean, we had done seven ballets together, so we were ready. And then Karen came in with, I, I just have to say, the most amazing, generous spirit and um, really, uh, like, she just has these, this faucet of amazing ideas that, <laughs> yeah, no, it really, and it was just really wonderful. So, we, so, so the back and forth felt very natural right away. And uh, I think that, that's been the case all the way through. Now it's sort of moving out in these concentric rings. Right now we have, you know, Harold Garcia, who is this artist we've been collaborating with. And with that same spirit of, yeah, let's try it. What do you think this, what should be in this vintage postcard of this imaginary space that we're creating? What are the skies doing here? And it's, and you know, with the, with the, our set designer, it's, it's, it's exciting to sort of now feel like really part of a much larger collaboration. So we know that we're focusing on the siren myth here, but we're in Florida now. Maybe, Karen, you could take us a little bit deeper into the story of the show. Yeah, so, I mean, you guys all, I'm sure you are familiar with the myth of the sirens. What I didn't know um, originally was that they received these wings from the gods as a gift to go look for Persephone, who's been taken to the underworld. Um, they despair, they sink down to the rocks, they turn into these sort of cannibalistic monsters. Um, 
I, <laughs> you guys know the trajectory. Like, <laughs> I mean, who hasn't been there on a Wednesday sometimes? <laughs> um, they're like, they give up on the search for spring, right? And they, and um, so it seemed to me like, oh, this is, they're the original victims of this. And despair did feel like a contagion at that moment. I mean, this was pre-pandemic, but I don't, we don't need to even do much in this show to cue up that music, I promise, inside each of you, because we're all suspended in that same milieu. Everyone knows how transmissible that song of despair is right now. Every day, every time you turn on your phone, you're implicated in other ongoing crises. You know, we, so I think that was the atmosphere that we met in, and like, what kind of story would it, what, could we tell that would feel significant? And then, you know, you want to undercut some of that self-seriousness. So I was like, could the sirens be in their new money lair in Florida? <laughs> and could they be singing to, like, lure RVs off the highway to a tourist trap? And from there, in our story, um, they drown in an accident. Each one kind of pulls the other under. They fail to rescue each other. And their spirits haunt this grotto. At times of great crisis, people start hearing that song in their dreams and it's calling to them. And so this was, I think, kind of hilarious in retrospect. I was like, Ellis, could you write a music that is so otherworldly and cold and alluring? People leave their lives and travel to the threshold of this grotto. And yet then, could you, as they tell their stories to one another, weave that music together into a song to pull them back from the brink? He was like, sure, <laughs> sure lady. <laughs> Thanks for the assignment. And I think that, so that was the original sort of idea, was sort of having, letting it, letting it live. Um, I, I really can't abide things that are just droning, monotone, lyrical, right? That's not how life feels. And um, to, the idea of doing it in this contemporary way where such diverse people, what the, the one thing they think they have in common is that they're haunted by this song. And then they just start to discover by sharing these stories, which you'll see in the dance solos, oh, we can merge into each other's lives. We can merge into each other's fictions. And that, and so I asked them both to do this. That was also my homework assignment to Troy. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, or that was the challenge of the show, was finding a way to show that, those, those polarities and that, um, you know, how in, in the original myth also Odysseus lashes himself to the mass. But in this show, we have very broken people who are, you know, arriving at this place in, in a real low in their lives. And they, they bind themselves to one another. You know, they brace themselves that way. I think that's a, a great way to lead us into the first thing we're going to watch tonight, which is the commercial that is featured in the show. Maybe, Troy, you want to talk a little bit about this, too. It features, um, you know, some of the sillier elements of the show that, you know, of course, it, we're dealing with these darker themes, but it's often cut with comedy. So maybe you can talk a, a bit about this commercial we're about to see. Yeah, so this, this commercial takes place in Act One, and during Act One, we follow this character, Feli Sperto, uh, who's recently suffered a pretty terrible loss. And we see him in his bedroom, and he has this, this nightmare. So the show actually begins with the nightmare in which we see the sirens, and we see them turn into these hideous monsters, and then we see them actually split him into two. And we see this repetitive trauma that Feli Sperto is going through. And inside his dream, there's a very specific melody that starts out... Um, very joyful and, and silly, um, and then it gets somewhat scary. Um, and unable to sleep, he wakes up and he starts flipping through the TV channels, and then this very uncanny commercial pops on for this campground called The Night Falls. And what is extremely jarring to him is that it is the song from his nightmare that is featured in this commercial in a very different way. Right, it's it's the uh, it's the song from his nightmare, but um, in this sort of hokey old commercial that may, seems like it's been playing for decades, you know. So it's a uh, tonally very different than the way he experiences it, but he recognizes the melody, and it's the inciting kind of incident that brings him to this campground. Let's have a look at the commercial. <laughs> This weekend, come with us and tailgate a celestial event. The solar eclipse and the spectacular spring tide. Watch water spout 20 feet through holes in the Anastasia limestone caverns. Whirlpools galore in Florida's eeriest echoes.
fall under the spell of the Siren Sisters at the Night Falls Grotto. Nightly concerts in our natural amphitheater. Campgrounds open at dawn, dogs welcome, alcohol tolerated, fireworks discouraged. I, I love how there, there are those moments in the show that, like, that are just truly hysterical and kind of cut through some of the, the tougher parts of the show. Um, I want to hear a little bit about how the pandemic changed, um, I guess, the content of the show, but also the creative process. You know, like you said, you, you started working on this in 2017, so pre-pandemic, but it's something that immediately feels very relatable to that moment that we all experienced together. Um, so firstly, maybe, Karen, you want to start by talking about if, uh, if it changed any of the content, did it, did it feel like, I don't know, maybe aggressive to kind of directly confront something that we all dealt with? Um, you know, we had done a workshop of this in 2018, um, uh, and so we had, you know, some idea of what kind of changes that we wanted to make, and we were talking a lot about, you know, the how to hold these tones, right? How to, how to kind of toggle between this, this world that you just saw and something that feels more mythic and sublime. Um, and then when this pandemic, that's, I mean, it's true that our ballet project, our hybrid um, opera about uh, a musical contagion of despair was interrupted by a contagion, so that sucked. <laughs> not, not our favorite uh, thing to have happened. Um, I think one thing that we sort of were aware of then was that you could cue up that music in people pretty lightly. So we had tried some other kinds of backstory even for these characters. You know, um, other kinds of it, it, sort of, uh, I think at one point we talked about with somebody, you know, um, did they survive a mass shooting, like things like this. And then we decided to m move away from that um, because it sort of felt like it, this is just, this is the world we can assume. You know, people are bringing that. Um, when they come to see uh, the show, um, we did a we did a springboard virtual workshop during the pandemic, and it turns out Zoom, which I find sort of unbearable, with these guys is very fun. <laughs> it was like our summer camp. We, I mean, this project actually s mostly started on Zoom yeah. in 2017. We were trailblazers in that way, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, then to go back yeah. to it, of course. Um, but I think it clarified. The pandemic really clarified, I think, this show's meaning, and I think that our holistic purpose for wanting to create and tell this particular story um, became much more focused. And I think that we, you know, at a certain point, people didn't know what repetitive trauma necessarily felt like. I think people did, at, but we, we, at one point, were writing that into the show. And then the pandemic started, and we were like, no, this repetitive trauma is a starting point for these people, and it's about how you move past that and form a community regardless of where you come from. Maybe, Ellis, you could talk a bit about uh, the creative process during that time, because you know, usually you have um, a deadline, you have to deliver, you know, we, all of your compositions have to be in by you know, whatever date, but you know, with everything delayed, it gives you time to reconsider the things you've done. Was that a, a good or a bad or? Totally, I mean, um, the compositional process for this show has, was really different than any other project I've been a part of um, because it did happen kind of episodically. There was like a workshop in 2018, there was a workshop in 2019, um, and then there was this one in 2021, and each one of them had very different kind of um, circumstances around them. The one in 2018, we were um, casting mostly uh, people from like a music theater world 
and we were devising it on the fly. It, you know, it felt a little bit more disjointed, but they, there's a lot of really good material there. Uh, and then 2019, we cast mo actually mostly people from the opera world um, on the singing side, uh, of course, not the dancers. But um, and that was a different kind of thing because it made me, and it was just with a piano and and voices, and that was really different for me because it made me think about the larger sweep of the story. And there's no great equalizer better than just like a piano to, you know, to really uh, lay bare the bones of what you've put together. Um, and so that was really helpful structurally, actually, to think about how is this show going to be told in a way that feels um, that the, the, the structure of the show uh, mirrors the thing that we're trying to do, which is bind a bunch of disparate people together into this sort of communal thing. Yeah. And in fact, I think a lot of language, we, we removed a lot of sort of like the, the scaffolding of, um, you know, we, there, there were sort of more, uh, you know, bridges. We weren't, because we, we, this was such a new thing, we weren't really sure like what are words going to do, what, where is the dance going to kind of do the more of the storytelling. And so I think we gave a lot of, of that to the dance and just trust that you'll see, you know, you'll see these strangers becoming a community and you'll see that leap of empathy bridging people out of their loneliness and between bodies very physically. You'll see that struggle to make meaning and to mean something to one another very physically in the show. Right. And that's exactly what we're gonna see with the first dance we're gonna watch tonight, which is um, Are You Someone They Sing To? Uh, Troy, maybe you could talk a little bit about this uh, particular section and uh, I think it, it speaks um, to what Karen was just saying about how we see this community building and this is gonna be the very beginning of that sort of feeling in the show. Yeah, and before I do that, I just wanna give a quick note as to how the show is staged, uh, which is, I think, very important for what you, know, you can imagine in your mind right now. And I think how we're metaphorically displaying what this recurring nightmare does to people is that actually, it metaphorically s removes a part of you, you know, your inner voice, your inner compass, you know, the part of you who longs to live. Um, and so the bodies that are left, they, some, a part of them is missing. And so every character in the show is actually double casted. Um, and there's a quite elevated platform far upstage. Um, and so throughout the entire show, you see both a singer and a dancer, and two people come together to um, portray a character. I know we'll talk more about that later, but I just wanted you all to kind of visualize because we have, you know, in terms of this space right now, we have the singers over here on the uh, stage left side of the lip, and we have the dancers on the stage. So, um, but in the actual production, you'll see both of them at the same time and throughout the entire show. Uh, this first, um, excerpt, Are You Someone They Sing To, takes place right at the top of Act Two. Feli Sperto has just seen that commercial, and he's at this stage where he really just has nothing left to lose, so he makes the leap, <laughs> travels down, you know, maybe buys a bus ticket to Crystal River, Florida, goes down there, and when he gets there, it looks nothing like the commercial. It's run down, it's been abandoned, it's not this wonderful place. You know, commercialism has somewhat destroyed this place. and. When he gets there, he, I mean, he has no idea what to expect, but he runs into all of these people who, while very different from him, have a similar look on their faces and are similarly confused and similarly exhausted. Um, and they're just curious as to why other people would be there. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, let's have a look.
Somewhere you're yearning to go Are you someone they sing to? Does it call tide rise inside you? song blows in. Did you hear voices that chased you here? Are you the concert hall in It's just so exciting to see this. We've been working in the studio with demos and just to have these incredible singers elevate your score beyond what it already is, it's just like, I have chills. And, and I know Karen's been saying the same thing, just getting to finally take this next step is so exciting. Um, but Ellis, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what's already been mentioned, that you were tasked with this impossible <laughs> ask to create something that was so you know, devastatingly beautiful. It could cause you to, to leave your life behind, but then it also has to double as this sort of like silly commercial jingle. Um, where do you start with? <laughs> you know? Yeah, that was, it was a, a fun challenge. Um, and uh, I think the way that I tried to approach it was basically to think, okay, start with really small building blocks so that you can take those building blocks and then you can twist them in any given direction. And I also, I spent some time thinking about how the siren song would manifest to people. And at first I was like, oh, it's the same song every time. And then I thought, 
um, that may be more psychologically interesting is a version where every person hears it a little bit differently. Um, and it has resonances with the song for other people, but you know, depending on their lives, circumstances, it's just different. So that actually led me to basically think about um, these small little building blocks that you can easily thread into lots of different ty types of music. So there's kind of two gestures that are woven throughout the whole piece. One is this ya da 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 these little minor, minor third kind of thing, um, which is very easy to uh, twist all the way into a commercial for a Florida campground, but also you can do a lot um, with that kind of the sort of the braiding of these kind of gestures. Uh, and then the other one is um, da da da, just a major second. And it's this sort of this kind of song of the shore, as Karen was talking about. It's this sort of this mantra that people repeat to themselves. And I also wanted them to feel kind of related to each other because, you know, um, these sirens, you know, used to be humans as well. There's this kind of humanity that comes with despair, right? That it's like, and so I wanted to be able to braid both of those things together as well. So when you start with small things like that, um, there's a lot of freedom. Um, and so, you know, you, you'll hear these things come over, up over and over again, and they kind of morph depending on where the source of the light is at any given time. Um, and, uh, you know, d and depending on the character, the songs sound very different because of that. We're going to take the chance now to hear the siren song. Would you like to, to set up this moment in the show for us a little bit? Sure, yeah. So this is, uh, this is in Act 3, and Felice Berto has um, been pulled down by despair and loss of control into this grotto, uh, and it's a very sort of liminal, sort of haunted-seeming place, and there's these three sirens who uh, um, are there, and they sing this song to him, and I wanted it to feel very chimerical, that there was, that it, it sort of sh it shifts even while you're looking at it, kind of like light, you know, coruscating light off the top of a, the, the water. Um, and we're very, very lucky to have these three singers, all these singers, which I'm just over the moon uh, having this group together. It's exactly who I would have wanted um, to do this, and uh, I'm just really happy to, to hear them sing it. Let's, let's have a listen to the siren song.
Say, I, I think I would definitely get in my car and drive to Central Florida for that. I mean, that's plenty of incentive. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the other characters in the show. We've talked about Felice Berto, but there's a whole roster of characters that are completely different from one another. And the show really hinges on that, that um, we feel differently for each one of them. And then what makes it work is that they come together in spite of being such disparate people. Um, so let's let's go to Karen and hear a little bit about the creation of these characters. Yeah. It's been a, this has been a real, a real joy of this process to me because I wrote the first um, sort of the, the scenario, the, the sketch of it. I have all these vignettes about people, not all of whom we chose to invite to the grotto. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some, some are sleeping better and they're not part of the show. You know, they took like a Tylenol pee. I'm like, oh, that was so weird. <laughs> It was just QVC. It wasn't a commercial inviting me down to Florida. Um, so, you know, we uh, Felice Berto really, uh, he's this teenager. He's the youngest. He's the most vulnerable. He's never experienced loss like this before. His boyfriend has recently died. Um, and he really can't imagine a way forward for himself. Um, and then Angela is, uh, I, I think at some point, uh, many years ago now, you know how uh, tennis stars have those bird-like cries, those like warrior cries? I was like, I, you know, and, and, and frequently also seem to have, um, you know, some challenges. Stay, I mean, I think everybody, everybody alive recognizes how hard it is to stay in the game and stay on your rhythm. And when you are um, getting pulled in this way, it feels like a disruption of linear time, a disruption of the ordinary rhythms of your thinking. Like despair to me has always felt like one held chord or getting really trapped in the wrong song, you know? I think even the grotto, the way it's like an echoing skull, people recognize that. So I wanted a tennis player who has a very public breakdown um, and just cannot find her footing again. She's in a losing season. Um, so we have like a warrior, we have a Demeter-like mother who loses her daughter to addiction, um, uh, to an overdose. Uh, someone who tried to save someone from this very realm, right, and, and was unable to. Um, we have George, who is a composer who has kind of given his whole life to his music in a very obsessive way and is kind of a thwarted Orpheus, right? He really wants to channel this song and he can't do it and loses his wife in the process, loses his chance to uh, have a family. Um, who am I forgetting? I found Hunter. Jarvis, we have Jarvis, who's an acrobat, who, you know, Jar who made a career out of his cartwheeling joy, and that felt like a really important note to hit in this show, uh, because the stories that they tell one another are not, it turns out, exclusively about the worst thing that ever happened to them. You know, Jarvis is like, let me tell you guys about the best day in my life, a real, a time that I used my superpower, which is laughter, to bind a community of people. So... And Alan, Hunter. oh my God, guys, thank you. Thanks, I'm, I'm failing at my homework. I need the Cliff the Cliffs notes for the show we've been writing for some time. Uh, Alan is a python hunter. I think I wanted a hunter. I wanted like a, you know, but, but you want a Gracchus, but you really want it to be a Floridian Gracchus. So uh, Alan is a, a hunter. I, I thought we also needed someone who was maybe not so excited about the unity that's building <laughs> and might have preferred the other way. So he's like a misanthrope and a, a sort of a, a blank-eyed hunter, and now that he is vulnerable in prey um, himself, he makes sort of a very grudging kind of leap of empathy. Um, but he's not as excited about it as some of the others. Um, there's a part of him that really would like to spiral out back into oblivion. 
So we get a chance in the show to see each one of them tell their own story to the whole community. Uh, tonight we'll be seeing one of those sections, which is Lola's song, and this is the, George the composer. And I thought, I I'm just curious, Ellis, does it make it easier to write for someone like that? Like, uh, I mean, it might be easier for me to tell a story about a ballet dancer. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, Karen, Karen. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it is, it is, uh, Karen talked about creating these sort of contemporary, uh, or these archetypal characters with um, contemporary resonances, and some of those resonances are, uh, you know, very contemporary and very resonant, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's really, it's fun because, um, you know, in this one, he, uh, what you're about to see, he tells the story of his romance with his wife, and how he kind of abandoned her um, without meaning to, just because he was obsessed with hearing this song. And um, there's this moment at the end where he just talks about the first song he ever wrote for her. And that's a really, when, when Karen sent me that lyric, I was just, it was so moving. Um, and also a chance to write the first song that he would ever have written for his wife. And it turned out that it was, uh, had, had a sort of, the, the echoes of the, song of the shore that everyone uses to bind uh, themselves to each other. So that's a, this is Lola's song, um, and this is George. Pumpkins with candles for eyes. I turned to Lola and said, Marry me. She cut a wide smile out of her face. Winter came, we were unafraid. January wedding, frosted hair on the bride. She wanted a baby. I said later we try. We were nineteen and had nothing but time. Nothing. Love kept us warm for a while, love kept us aglow, and she waited for years while I played the piano. First, I was trying to get famous, then I was failing to get famous. And I haunted our home, possessed by a song. Is the one she loves best. A simpler melody, and 
doesn't exist. Not a song for the ages or a song to charm stones. Lola's song was for her ears alone. So beautiful, so poignant, and, and that's just one episode that we get to see. You know, it, it, the second act really takes us on that whole arc. Um, you know, Jarvis has you smiling and laughing with, uh, like you said, like my the, my best day. You know, in contrast to some of the other harder stories there are to tell. I think one of the real gifts of the first workshop we did of this piece um, was seeing how powerful it is to watch people merge into your story with you. And I think as a writer, this is what is the joy of writing, right? You're an author, you're a character, and you're a reader, and you're all there. Um, and, uh, but it's so, it happens, it's so fast moving, it's an invisible thing. And I think for me always to see how uh, powerful it is, you know, in the choreography, these moments where they're portals and people can enter each other's stories, which is what we're always doing when we're talking to one another. You're always imagining a world with someone, even if they can't see it. And to make it, to externalize it and make it visible is very powerful, I think. Well, I want to hear a little bit from each of you about what you hope the audience takes away. You've spent so much of your time the past five, six years, like putting your heart and soul into this work. And now it's finally going to come together and be seen for a, a, in front of an audience for the first time. So what, are you, what do you want people to feel when they leave the theater? <clears throat> well, I think that Dance has this incredible capability to express things that are um, challenging to express with words, you know? And at the same time, it's not always so great with the details. Um, I think that sometimes this, you know, limits the form. And, you know, what we really set out here was to create something that connects, you know, transcends what we're trying to do in our individual forms to tell this story that hopefully can connect with people and relate to people across a broad spectrum. You know, there's been a lot of intellectual thought that's gone into this process, but it's been under the aim of trying to create something completely accessible and completely about people that we all know and understand and, you know, to offer some sort of, you know, antidote to division and you know, create a wonderful performance piece as well, but also, you know, share this this message of, you know, you have to listen to other people. And there's, you know, how do you form a community when all is almost lost? Yeah, I think my, um, to echo that, that point a little bit, um, I think uh, during the last few years, certainly during the pandemic, but I, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about the value. I mean, I remember when that happened, it was like, God, I am the most useless member of society. You know, I have no, no, I'm certainly not a, um, uh, I'm not a, you know, a, someone who's out there providing um, real help to people. And I felt very um, sad and also helpless about that. And I think that uh, this show, what I would like people to take away when they come see a show like this is that um, storytelling is, uh, it's the best gift we have to communicate to each other in ways that are, uh, can kind of come in through the trap door of the back of your, you know, hit you when you're not, where you're not, where you don't have your armor, you know? Yeah. And um, 
uh, and maybe change the way that you connect to other people or see the world. And so I don't know. I mean, that's very lofty, but I also hope they just like it. <laughs> but no, I think that you know, I think that it would be really wonderful if people, you know, if if there was this feeling of um, community building is the best thing that we can that we can do um, in order to create a, a better life uh, for ourselves and for other people. I'm just in it for the Hollywood mega bucks, guys. <laughs> I'm just. I just want to buy some some new furs online. I don't I don't know what these guys are talking about. I <laughs> I um no this it's it is um this is like the 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 project that has been the most meaningful to me that I've ever worked on. You know, not to knock books and stories that I myself write, but I think what has uh, <laughs> go find them on. <laughs> you know, go shop shop at your independent your local independent. Um, okay, I'm gonna reset. Hold on one sec, guys. I, I got excited about my joke. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, just hitting reset, because this is important. Working on this project with so many brilliant people, where we are actually building a dimensional world, a sonic world, a world of movement, seeing how much people have given to this. I mean, Michael, you know, you've been there with us through it. Um, it really enacts sort of the principle, I think, the whole ethos of, of this of this work and we have really made a world together and it has been a great joy and I've seen very, very different kinds of people giving what they partic their particular gifts ha have such value and, and, and this, this, it wouldn't exist, right, without all of us and it's been so moving to be a part of it and it's also modeled for me a way of being an artist in the world but also just a person in the world. I mean, like, we, we, we don't always see eye to eye, you know, we've had to work through and it's better for it, right, it's been, um, so much better for it. So getting to watch these isolated strangers arrive and think all they have in common is a nightmare and a vulnerability and build out of that to something strong and something where, as you can see in the kinds of dancers, Troy's cast and the singers, right? Different styles of movement, different histories, different ways of thinking, but we can really move in this unison and we can have this countervailing movement and we can imagine together. Um, and I think, uh, I really hope that, that people move from sort of that, that song of despair that I think most of us know, right? That vertical spin of it, right back out of the grotto and into dawn and possibility. Um, so that's, yeah. That's beautiful, Karen. Uh, we do have one final um, number for us to see before we head out tonight. Uh, it is for Medios, which closes out second act. Uh, Troy, maybe you could tell us a little bit about this final dance that we'll be seeing. Yeah, so uh, the first dance excerpt you saw, um, Are You Someone, was the very top of act two. And you know they all get to this place, and then there's this strange sign that says something like, the echoes will begin at nightfall there. And that's all that they have. And so they realize that they're waiting for something, and they organically start telling each other their stories. Um, Felisperto, though, he's kind of a wallflower. He's a little bit of a chameleon. He's not really participating in this. And everybody else is, and they, f they form this group. And they're like, come what may, we maybe have each other. We don't know, we just met. Um, but he's just there, and you know, he's the last person to tell his story. And by the end, it's this useful energy that kind of just lets everything loose and has an unintended you know, consequence. I also just should say um, that this was uh, intended to be sung live by David Marino, our, our Felice Berto singer, uh, and he is uh, in a show that has a, uh, some illness uh, situations, some COVID situations, and so it will be sung by the uh, demo recording of David Marino. Um, <laughs> and there's a part near the end where his voice sort of magically transforms into just this sort of like MIDI monk sound. It's like, uh oh, oh. Uh, and it's, uh, you just have to Space trust Space robot. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's we had changed the lyrics and you just have to trust us that the lyrics there are the most beautiful lyrics you've ever heard. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you, okay. yes. Great. Well, thank, before we watch for Medios, I want to thank all of you for coming out and uh, remind you to please come see this wonderful show uh, February 9th through 12th at Montclair State University. And now let's have a look at Remedios. Night. 
night my mama gathers aloe leaves and makes the sign of the cross. The book that's on her shelf lets me know that she has also suffered loss. Caseros para un corazón herido. Remedios caseros para un corazón herido. My mama gathers aloe leaves and makes the sign of the cross. She 